we call now, as your word declares, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. God, we want to just find ourselves under the shadow of the Almighty, in the secret place of the Most High, experiencing your touch, your love, experiencing what the world cannot give us. For your Bible declares that you have overcome the world. Help us to learn and grow. Help us to see and experience everything you have for us. And may nothing hinder, as your word promises and declares, no curse can ever break your promise. We stand on that in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, today's service is, is kind of like a, a dual learning. On one side, I'm going to be teaching something to those that are really Bible scholarly. And on the other hand, I'm going to teach something to those who I've been curious because we're in the book of Hebrews and a couple of chapters ago we looked at the foundations of faith the basic things today we're going to do a kind of a double study we're going to go through what's there and for some of you it's going to really pique your interest and then we're going to go back and and we're going to talk about a completely different subject very in um, I didn't know what else to do so that's what I did I'm planning that far ahead Verse 14 of chapter 14 of the book of Genesis says, Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Please give me your attention. Let me give you a background on what's going on. All the way back in the days of Abram. Notice it's Abram, not Abraham. Right? Did I get that right? When Abraham was yet young and the breath of God had not come in him yet, he was called Abram. Later, as the Holy Spirit came upon him, in the Jewish faith, they believed the ch, that word ch, was the breath of God. He later changed his name, God did, to Abraham in the Hebrew pronunciation. This is before. And God was working on his heart and taking him through things. Well, what happened was he was outside of the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. He had a nephew, Lot. They had made riches. They had gone through things. If you don't know the story of Abraham, I hope that in some way, even what I'm saying will tempt you, will tease you into start reading the book of Genesis because it's incredible to see what Abram went through to make him Abraham, who became, for you guys that are new to Scripture, Abraham is the father of all faithful. All Christians look to Abraham and go, that is our patriarch. That's the guy that started the whole belief system. That's how God started it, in this one man. However, Abraham decided he was going to follow an open plane and seek the Lord, but his nephew Lot decided he wanted to be in the big city around all the big shots. And when he was there, five kings got into a big argument, a big war, five kings with big nations, and Lot got taken captive. Abraham, by the power of God, without fear, took 300 men and said, I got to go rescue my, my son. He called him his son, it was his nephew. I got to go rescue him. So he takes 300 men from his neighborhood and he goes and he goes as far as Dan, which I should have looked up how far it was, but I didn't. Verse 15, he divided his forces against them by night and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the, valley, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Ketileamar and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand and he gave him a tithe of all. Now give me your attention. I want to tell you about all the story, how a guy tried to offer him money. It was almost like this king who had hundreds of thousands of 
troops went out to meet him and said, you MacGyver, you. How'd you do that? How'd you do that? How did you infiltrate my army with 300 men? How'd you do it? You're not talking about one army against another army. They stood, this was like one guy with a few hundred guys went in there and infiltrated this giant army, this big city, and rescued his, his nephew. We're not looking at that today, though. We're looking at Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Why are we looking at that? Well, leaving Genesis, we shan't be coming back. Please turn to chapter 7, the book of Hebrews. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Please again give me your attention. I told you today's thing is a little bit on the deeper side. This is for you who are more Bible says. When it comes to teaching the word of God, you guys that have been following the scriptures, you guys that have been in a, a Bible teaching church, what is the most important way to interpret scripture? With scripture. How does everybody learn how to teach the Bible with the Bible? Here, the writer of Hebrews teaching a Bible study using Old Testament to make his point, which is the very same reason as a Bible teacher, as a preacher, we do the same thing. We refer to only Scripture, to interpret Scripture, and anything else, you could be careful, you could be very, you must be very careful, because you could be on dangerous ground. Here, the writer of Hebrews, referring to the king of Salem, a man named Melchizedek. Now, as a little bit of a background, you'll notice, as you read Scripture, Melchizedek is one of the strangest characters in all Scripture. He doesn't have what's called the genealogy. Scripture is extremely careful, Old and New Testament, to lay out what's called the genealogy. This one begat that one, that one begat that one. There's a whole lot of begatten going on in Scripture. He has no begats. You don't know where he came from. And you don't know why the patriarch, the father of all faithful, would give him what's called a tithe. A tithe, that, that's a Hebrew word that means 10%. He gave the king of Salem, this guy Melchizedek, 10th of everything that he captured when he infiltrated Ketelemar's army. Are you still with me, understanding what I'm saying? Hold on, I'm going to get more detailed. I'm going to lose some of you. Try to stay with me, please. Verse 2, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, First being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Give me your attention again. Some people believe that this Melchizedek was what's called a Christophany. That's a big fancy Bible scholar word, which means a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. For you guys that are new to Scripture, again, Jesus Christ came as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. However, he was always, was, is, and always will be God Most High in heaven. And in time past, all through Old Testament, occasionally you'll see this figure come into play. And it makes no sense biblically that who this man came from, the same man appeared to Joshua when he was on the army, who are you, but I am king of the Lord's army, who are you, prince of the Lord's army, then the same appeared to uh, Samson's mother and father, ah, I've seen God, I'm going to die, but they didn't die, so how could they see God but not see God? Those are what's called Christophanies, and some believe that, that this man is a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus himself, before he came as a baby. I don't know if I believe that. But this, the, the, the evidences of their similarities are extremely similar. And that's what the writer of Hebrews tried to explain to us here. He had no beginning. He had no end. He had no mom. He had no dad. But yet he was like the Son of God. Are you with me? Still following me? Today's like a Bible. Today's like a Bible college class. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have not come from the loins of Abraham. 
though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Please, I'm sorry. Give me your attention. Let me explain. There are 12 tribes in Israel. 11 tribes were given an inheritance. One tribe wasn't. Anybody remember the name of that tribe? Levi. Levi was appointed the priests of the tribe. They were the ones, their inheritance was to serve God. They were the ones who were supposed to be the priests in the temple. Now, all of those, that tribe, Levi, stems from, going back, does anybody remember Moses' brother's name? Who said that? Good job. Aaron. Aaron's brother, Mo Moses' brother, Aaron, great-great-great-grandson, Levi, this would be the priestly lineage. Here he's trying to explain for you Bible people, for you that even may be Jewish here, how weird it is for a Jew not to believe in the Lord Jesus. So predicted it was, the picture of Melchizedek being this mirror, this picture image of even how we believe that Jesus was not only our Savior, but also, are you ready, our high priest. In the same way Melchizedek was a high priest forever, so too our Christ Jesus is that same type. He's not from the line of Levi. Then how could he be a priest? Same way that Melchizedek was a priest, even though he had no lineage. Thus, both are confirming each other. Stay with me as we continue our Bible student. You know what I mean. Verse 6, But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, Melchizedek is blessing Abraham. Now how could the lesser bless the greater? That's what he's trying to say. It makes no sense because his lineage is that of not of royalty or priestliness. Are you with me? Good. Verse 8. Here mortal men receive tithes, that is, on earth, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met, met him. So he says, Abraham giving this guy tithes makes no sense. We're not supposed to give them tithes. They're supposed to give them tithes. We're supposed to bring our tithes to Levi. So why would Levi give tithes? Well, not Levi, he says, but that, that which gave birth to Levi later on. Abraham being the father of all the nations. Are you understanding what I'm saying? If anybody's getting lost, please tell me. Okay, you're with me. Therefore, verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for any priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? He says there, basically, if being a good person can save you, then we don't need Jesus. So what was Melchizedek even there for? If we didn't need Jesus, then they didn't need Melchizedek. That was the picture, the image that the Jew who's reading the Old Testament looks and goes, who's this guy Melchizedek anyway? Oi, we don't know. God knows. God knows. Deuteronomy 28, 28 says the secret things belong to God. The secret things belong to God. And that's, they, they, the Jews always say, Deuteronomy 28, who knows what they do? Who knows why they do it? But we know now the reason they did that was so that the Jews can look and go, Melchizedek? Jesus. Was that? Yes. That's what God was doing even back then, 5,000 plus years ago. Look, Jew, Hebrew, there he is. Figure it out. Come on board with us. No way will we ever do that. All Jews talk like that, don't they? For the priesthood being changed of necessity there's also a change of the law. For he whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord Jesus arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeliness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of fleshly commandments, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Give me your attention. There he's quoting from Psalm 110. He says this, 
Stay with me. Be of a learning heart and mind right now. He says, listen, if the priestly line came from Levi, yet Melchizedek was not from Levi, and yet the same guy we call our high priest Jesus was also not from Levi, but from the tribe of Judah, who had no business being a priest, because the, the line of Judah, another one of the tribes, who also came from the loins of Abraham, no priest was supposed to come from there. If that happened in one way, then ipso facto, it must be logical spiritually to say, because he lives, we live. Because he is without, without end, he never has to worry about being replaced. He is our high priest. Continuing. Verse 18. For on one hand there is an annulling of the former commandments because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Please, let me explain to you what that means. He says, listen to me. Christ Jesus put an end to the law to the Jew. This was crazy. Even to the people of the world, even if you're here and you're new to church, listen to me. Being a good person don't get you into heaven. You can be the best person in the world. You can visit every funeral home. You can visit every convalescent home. You can be the nicest guy in the world. If you don't know Jesus, you're not getting there. Do you understand that? Here he says, to tell the Jew that it's great that you have thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not make a graven image, but understand the law was not for you to use to tell yourself you're going to heaven. It was there for you to see how wicked you are and why you needed a Savior. Do you understand what I'm saying? He says the law is annulled because of grace in Christ Jesus. How many of you guys here never told a lie? Then you're all guilty. Then you're all guilty. And the Bible actually says that he who breaks one law breaks them all. You can't win like that. And that's exactly what he's saying. Continuing. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect. It didn't make anything perfect because it just showed you how sinful you are, how much you needed a Savior. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The hope is, God, I can't stop breaking these commandments. I can't. Now listen, bring it up to date now to our life. How many of you guys are a slave to your sin? No hands. I'm a slave to sin. I hate it. I'm sick and tired of going home every day, laying down in my bed, closing my eyes, and going, God, why again? I say I don't want to. I tell myself I don't want to, but again, I do. How come I do everything I hate and that which I don't want to do, I wind up doing and that which I don't want to, that which I want to do, I don't do. I, I want to do good and I don't do it. I, want, I don't want to do bad and I do it. You know exactly what I mean. Verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not priest made with an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are priests forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, Quoting from Psalm 110, Bible scholars, he says, He was declared a priest forever, the Lord Jesus was, because God said so, not through his bloodline. Because if you were from Levi's line, you were expected to be a priest. What if you didn't want to be a priest? Too bad. You were born from Levi. This man was a priest because God declared him priest. You with me? Good. By so much more Jesus had become a surety of a better covenant, for sure that is. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Please give me your attention. This is so good and important. We're almost done with this part of the Bible study. Please try to stay with me. Scripturally, he's trying to tell them, priests live and die. And if you really like the priest that you have, hey guys, I got news for you. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm almost 50 years old. I don't know how many more years I got preaching. And what if Sean, after he finishes fighting, decides he's going to be the pastor and we anoint him? He goes, there's some of you guys like, I don't like Sean. Well, I like Sean. I'm glad. I don't. Okay, well, how about Savior. Savior decides he wants to be. So he comes up. 
you know what? Jesus lived forever. You never have to worry. Never. You love your priest, and he loves you, and he is immutable, unchangeable, and living forever. That's what he says here. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He is, and now watch what he says here. This, verse 29 is probably the best verse in the entire Bible. Verse 25. Therefore he is also able to save those, save to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. The uttermost. The uttermost. That means nobody is far away for God. Nobody is too far. Nobody has done what can't be. Nobody is too far away for God. That's good news for me. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Since he always lives to make intercession. Let me tell you what that means. Somebody is in a crack house. They've destroyed their lives. They've destroyed the people that love them. And there they are, probably laying in their own vomit and blood, calling out to God because of whatever reason. I mean, I'm giving you a hypothetical, but I'm trying to explain this to you. And they turn around and they go, God, I've messed up my life so bad. Before I die, can you forgive me? And they go through the list of their sins with God, and they go, God, I've been a part of abortions, and I've smoked crack, and I've robbed, and I've stolen, and I've taken your name in vain, and I've abused and misused. And it says here that he saves to the uttermost because he makes intercession. He lives to make intercession. Without Jesus Christ, God says, I'm sorry. There's rules and regulations. You need to keep the law. But he now comes right in between and he takes that prayer and he goes, Father, here he is. And he doesn't see the deeds, the horrible things that this person has done. You know what he sees? He sees his son Jesus making the argument, the intercession. Father, my blood forgives them. What an awesome thing that is. Isn't that good news for us too? Uh, and, and look at the, the last part of, of, of chapter 7. He says, For such a high priest was fitting for us. Oh man, isn't that true? <laughs> Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Verse 27. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. Let me say, tell you what he says there. A, a priest, let's say one priest was leaving and another priest was coming. He was leaving his shift. So he gets there in the morning and he goes, oh, they, I had such a terrible day. So the first thing he has to do is spend the first few hours atoning for his own sins. I woke up this morning. Oh, God, I need you so bad, more than ever. I'm going to get in front of this word and these people are going to be here expecting. Please. And then all of a sudden, 7.30 rolls around. I hear my daughter stirring. I'm like, I ain't even near ready. But I don't want my wife to get up. She's up every day with that. So, okay, here's a drink. You guys play in there. Daddy, Daddy, Kiki did this. Daddy, Daddy, Cammy did this. I'm nowhere near ready. You ain't got to worry about with Jesus. He don't got to offer any sacrifices. He's separate from sinners. He's clean all the time. You know what that means? <laughs> Jesus, yeah, right here. Never busy. Never on the other line. Never. Love that. <laughs> Finishing. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected. And you can circle that last word, underline it, highlight it, whatever it is you do. Forever. Forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever, no matter where you go, no matter what you've done, no matter how low you sink, no matter how high you go, there he is. Not a weak man appointed by bloodline, appointed by God according to Psalm 110. Again, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek because I declared it. The same God that declared Abraham 
Same thing he said. This is where it all comes into play. He declared Abraham was the first of the faithful. We talked about this. Who is Abraham? He's a man from Mesopotamia. His family didn't know nothing about God. How did they declare? How did God declare? Why is he the first? Because God said so. Why are you a Christian? Because God said so. As he chose Abraham out of the world, so he chose you. The Bible says that he chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak things, to put to shame those that are strong. So again, you've heard me say this, repeating what Ken Graves said. God's choosing of you is not a compliment. But it is an honor. Isn't that great to know? So now I can understand just a little bit. Biblically, we've looked, like I said, like a, like a, like a Bible uh, college course. You understand now. To the Jew, this makes sense. To the Christian, even to those that are far off, now we understand. However, going back, now we're going to do a different study in the same chapter. Notice what it says. Go back to the beginning of chapter 7. He says this. Verse 4, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Yes, we're going to talk about tithing because that's where we are in Scripture. The giving of your money to God. I'm going to spend about ten minutes of it. I'm going to explain it and then we're going to close. However, if you have questions, please reserve them to the end because this is always a touchy subject. Listen to me. God gives to you, here's the simplest form, the way my pastor, who is way better teacher than me, he's the simplest form. If you are a Christian and you believe that everything you have comes from God, then your life and everything you have in it is like a 100 pound, 100 count bag of gum, gumballs. Here. And God gives you 100 gumballs and says, here. And he says, I'm giving you 100, I want you to give me 10. Why? It's how you learn. And now if you're a mother or a father in this place, you know that it's true. It's one thing you want your kids to be more than anything else is gracious, thankful, right? Well, why did he choose 10%? Because 10% is 10% for everybody. Now, what does that mean? I have to give money to the church? Now, listen to me. Here's a little caveat I'm going to offer you guys. A couple of chapters ago, we looked at the foundations of faith. You guys remember we looked at baptisms two or three weeks ago. Does anybody remember that? I had it up on the board and everything. Do you know what wasn't there? Tithing. If you don't understand this principle, please keep your money. The church's rent is paid this month. We're okay. I think next month, too. I think we have enough money. If nobody gave another dime, I think we have enough for the next month, and then, we, then, we, then we'd be in trouble. All right, keep your money, especially if you're new. If you're a, you know... New to God, new to church, we're not asking for your money. I don't need your money. I don't make, a, uh, I don't make a, um, a salary here at this church. I don't get a check every week. I get a monthly stipend that helps me pay my mortgage. However, I do not get a check. It, my money that I get has nothing to do with what you put in that box. Zero. So I'm telling you this from the beginning. This is a little bit deeper when it comes to tithing, which is completely opposite of what most churches, where they tell you flat out, give. And some churches, you all that go to some of them, name it and claim it, the Word of Faith churches, they, they, um, they will either have three offerings in one day. Anybody go to those churches? So there's a few of you guys where first you get there and they'll have, and everybody will walk up the aisle and you have to put it in there. And then a few minutes later, they'll have another offering. And then at the end, before you leave, they'll have another offering. I mean, you've got to literally plan it out. You've got to put money in one pocket, money in another pocket. Okay, I'm going to give this one this offering, that one that offering. Some churches, they pass a plate around. And they go back and forth and the deacon sit and put it in there. And then they go to the next place. We don't do that. Now, I have nothing against those churches that the way they do that, that's between them and God. They have to stand before God as I have to stand before God of how I did my church. Scripturally speaking, though, it says the foundations of the faith that are in chapter 6, remember? Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. See nothing about giving your money in there. So as we get to it in Scripture, I'll teach it. If you're not there, please, you can turn off and just 
remember the last verse we just read, that God saves to the other most of those who he ever lives to make intercession. Let that be the last thing you hear. But those that are serious about God, and here's more important than that. This is a weird thing. You start going to church, and it's crazy the way God starts knocking on your heart immediately. For some reason, people are drawn toward putting money in that box. Like, I never ask you for money, but yet some people just put, why? Because it makes you feel good. There's something inside you that knows what you got you didn't earn, even if you earned what you got. You know somebody else gave it to you. You know it. Does everybody know what I'm saying? Okay. My story on tithing. Never tithed. Me and my wife knew nothing about it going back about 16, 17 years ago. We just started getting serious about the things of the Lord. I was leaving for prison. It was 1996. I was leaving in a few weeks. Business was shot. The government pretty much came and shut my business down. That's why I was going to prison. And I said, baby, we're in trouble. I'm like, double trouble. I'm going to have to take the kids and move in with your parents if they'll have us. Or I don't know. And somebody said, Ryan, do you tithe? I'm like, I don't even know what tithing is. That's giving a percentage of your salary to God. Why would I do that? Because he gave it to you. Yeah, he did. So, I said, do I give him my gross or my net? Because my net's pretty gross. <laughs> Start anywhere you want, the guy said, which is the greatest answer. Whatever. Start there. So I took my net, what I was bringing in a, a week, I write the check and put it in there. Sometimes it was by faith. And literally, for me and my wife, and you could, ladies, you could testify, ask my wife later, literally from the week we started, my salary, my, my business increased, 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 increased. And we have lacked for nothing since that day. Nothing. I'm not telling you we're rich. I'm not telling you that we've been, that it hasn't been tough times, that we haven't tightened the belt, but we've not missed nothing. And as a matter of fact, about four or five years after that, we decided to test God because the book of Malachi, and you guys that are interested in stuff like this, Malachi chapter 3 talks about testing God. The only place in all Scripture where it talks about testing God. Because the Lord Jesus himself said, you shall not test the Lord thy God. It says, test in this. Bring your tithes to the storehouse. And I will bless you so much that your house won't even be able to be big enough to handle it. So me and my wife started tithing on what we wanted to make, not what we were making. We started tithing almost 40% of what was coming in. And God met us there. God's been faithful. God owes me zero, nothing. Even though the lean times over the last five years since the hurricane, God owes me zero. God owes me nothing. I'm... Now, do you want to know something? There's just some interesting facts for you. If the church tithed even 5%, we could put an end to poverty. There would be no more poor people in this country. On the average, the average church-going Christian tithes 2.5% of his income. We could actually pay off the national debt if we wanted to as a church, if everybody who claims to be a Christian actually tithed 10%. 10%. Well, for some people, that's a lot of money. I mean, if you're a millionaire, 10%, what's that, 100000 Well, you think that's any more than somebody who only makes 100 bucks and it's 10 bucks? 10% is 10%. Yeah, but then somebody will say to me, and they always do, does the New Testament say 10% or did you make up that number by yourself? Well, here's the thing now, and I want to show you. Didn't we just read in Genesis that Abraham or Abram at the time, tithed 10%. Well, guess what? That predates the law. That was before the law of Moses said to give 10%. So tithing predates the law, is in the law, so what should we do post-dating the law? So now that we're in the New Testament, now that, now that we live under grace, should we not give? Well, let's see. God gave the law 
Before he gave the law, he appointed by grace those who were being saved. Afterward, he gave his son. Sounds like God's giving more in the end than he's giving at the beginning, doesn't it? Since he gave his son, which is, according to the Bible, and according to you also, if you had to give your kid everything. What if somebody knocked on your door with a gun, with a group of others with guns, and said, give me every dime in your house, or I'm going to take your kids. Would you play Let's Make a Deal? Some of you guys would, but I digress. You'd give them everything. So how could we say in the New Testament, when God gave us his son, yes, I don't have to give anything now. No, you don't have to. As a matter of fact, according to 2 Thessalonians, God loves a cheerful giver. He wants it to be Hilarious. He wants you to walk up to Pastor. I'm giving how much? <laughs> Hope it clears. He wants you to be like where me and my wife are at now. Absolutely afraid not to. I call up Julia three or four times a year. How, how much have I given so far? I'm not, I'm, I'm not keeping good track. Sometimes I'll do a show, you know, we'll do like a, a, a business conference and we'll make a little extra. I want to just make sure I'm ahead of the curve. I've got to make sure. I don't ever want to get behind on, on, on ties. Why? Because I'm afraid because of where I come from. Guys, when I moved down to Flowers, I was living out of my car. I was homeless. I'd wake up and I'd clean a guy's warehouse complex. He'd pay me five bucks an hour. And then my grandmother, when she moved back up north, I'd, I'd stay at her house, kind of squatting in there, if, if you will. And then she'd come back, and eventually we, sa we saved up enough money, and I met this girl who's silly enough to let me actually move in with her. Bad choice. So I, I, I ain't going back to those days. And if God's word's powerful as I think it is, I'm tithing every single week because there's no way I'm going back to those days, and I'm afraid not to. Do you understand the, the difference in that heart? I have to. I have to because I want to because I believe everything I have came from God. Are you understanding me? Now, according to Scripture, there's three different ways to give. There's a tithe, there's an offering, and there's an alms. The tithe is your 10% off the top of your gross that you give to God going properly now. Again, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating this. This is not for everybody here. If you are curious about these things now, you know, I've been, I've been wondering about that. Don't impulsively write a check now and drop it in a box. Don't do that. Pray about it. Think about it. Do what you think is best according to how the Holy Spirit leads you. We don't need your money. This is not a sales pitch. Let me tell you something. This is the hardest thing. And I'll tell you what. I want you to amen if you found this to be in your life. Giving to God is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity to sanctify everything else that you have. I'll come back to that. So you take your first 10% and you put it in the storehouse so we could feed the poor, uh, feed the hungry, um, take care of the, do all of the ministries that we do here. Your kids over there and all the materials that they need, the lights, all that stuff. Then there's what's called an offering. You'll see on our, that little stand we got out there, we have pictures of these uh, people who are missionaries. That's what's called an offering. That's apart from the tithe. That's where, oh, I got this ministry. We have that woman, Claudia Rango. She's in Uganda at the, uh, at the uh, she's got that orphanage there. Love that girl. When she comes into town, she brings the little girls. And they're little, they're little, um, little African girls. Oh, you come and give me big hug, Ryan. I give her a squeeze. I put it down. She goes, you can do it again if you like. Said, <laughs> she's the cutest little things in the world. And then we've got... Um, Paul and Marcia Cowley, who are in Kenya, they're raising... These are our, our, our offerings that we give. It's completely separate from the church. Uh, I put them, me and my wife have them on auto pay. We used to do Compassion Kids for years and years and years, and, and we moved those over to Romania, those Romanian kids with Cornell and Karen Bokor. So we give you guys, we offer the opportunities, and we're super careful about the names we put up there. Because we don't want to give to... Um, some, some organizations, for every dollar you give, 60% goes to administration fees and you know, blah, blah. And they, they use it as an excuse. Well, 
totally different situation, and we'll, we'll talk about that another day. However, then there's the alms. You guys might have heard that the, when beggars, alms for the poor, A-L-M-S. The Lord Jesus actually talked about that. He said, don't let your right hand even know what your left hand's doing. Don't keep track of that. You see somebody in need, you know how many people ask me, do you, those bums that, that beg on the street, do you give those guys that hold the sign up, I will work for you, do you give them? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Depends how I feel the Holy Spirit, depends on the mood I'm in. I don't have a, a, a pattern either way. No, I never give those because they'll just go buy alcohol. Like, so what? You know, if alcohol makes them happy and they love Jesus, give them, you know, I wish they wouldn't buy it, but, I mean, you know, give them money, pray for them. He goes and buys booze and gets drunk. Like you're judging all of a sudden. I used to go buy booze and get drunk. So, ties, offering, alms. Now, what happens when you give your tithe is you sanctify everything else you have. So you have a hundred bucks, let's use a thousand. You have a thousand bucks, you take a hundred of it, you first give that to God for your tithe. 900 is now yours. Oh, man, I took my wife out to dinner. We spent 100 bucks on dinner. Man, that's just too much. There's poor people everywhere. Who spends $100 on dinner? I do. I take my wife out to dinner. We were poor for a long time living off of McDonald's, ramen noodles. If I got an extra 100 bucks, I'm taking my wife out to dinner. 100 bucks? That's a lot of money to spend on dinner. You know what? It's okay. Because that 900, God says I can do whatever I want with it. It's sanctified. See, some people pull up in a Range Rover. Some people pull up, whoa, man, must be nice. Yeah, it is nice. With that first 50,000, that person gave. And they could do whatever they want. With that first 100,000, they gave. Now that person can do whatever they want. And they don't need the sneering of our judgment upon what they have or what they don't have. Not if they bless the rest of their money. And now the rest of their money has what's called seeds in it. Seeds. It's the craziest thing. Once God starts blessing you, it's like, is any more money going to come in? This is insane. I remember sitting back going, baby, I think we're rich. <laughs> Why? Because we don't owe anybody money. It's a great feeling to know that everything else that you have is yours because you first blessed God with it. Are you with me? New Testament principle should be greater than the old, for it's greater than the old. So do you have to tithe? No, you never had to tithe. In the Old Testament, if you didn't tithe, you were breaking the law. The law has been abolished. So in the New Testament, won't stop you from getting to heaven, but the law of God declares he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. You having money problems? You sit down, I can't make it, and the first thing I do is I call Julian and I say, Julian, can you give me a little background on the tithing of such and such person? And she goes, well, they tithed once in February of 2011. I don't ask how much, I just ask what consistency. And I go, well, here's your problem, you're not tithing. I thought you didn't look at the tithes. How could you say that to me? Listen, you want help or not? It's the exact same situation. You're having a fight with your wife. You pray together? No. Well, you need to pray together. No, but let me tell you the real problem. No, no, the problem is you don't pray together. No, no, but let me tell you the real problem. She did this, she did that. No, no, the problem is you're not praying together. No, no, let me tell you the real problem. No, let me tell you the real problem. You don't tithe! You're not blessed, man! You can't expect your money to be blessed unless you're blessing your money. You understand? If this guy is blessing, if Abraham blessed the king of Salem, Melchizedek, with 10%, when he put his life on the line, that's what I say the minimum is. And quite adversely, guys, this works the same way for time. Some people are, oh, I don't have time to do a morning devotion. Listen, God gives you 24 hours in a day. Let's, for argument's sake, say you're up 15 of those hours. Take 10% of those and give that to God. You should be spending a good two hours a day. But Okay, let's say you're only awake 12 hours a day. Okay, 
Let me make it easy for you. Be a cheapskate with God. That's fine. Better start. Take an hour a day. Spend a half hour in prayer, half hour in the Word. Maybe 15 minutes, knock on some neighbor's doors and just give them a track. Well, that's a lot of work. You want to bless life or not? We got this young wrestler. We just prayed for Jonah. We prayed for him. Jonah, do me a favor. This week, I don't want you to tr train or practice at all. No training, no practice, okay? Do your next tournament without training and practice, okay? And let me know how you do. How do you think he's going to do, guys? Same situation spiritually. I want, so, I want God to do so much more in my life. Well, what are you giving God? Nothing. But I want him to do something in my life. Oh. Well, you talked about grace. Listen, there's a, great, there's a great psalm that I always lean on. If the Lord had not been on our side, all of our enemies would have swallowed us alive. If the Lord had not been on our side, all the mighty waters would have swept over us. You're alive, man. It's a good thing. God's protection is upon you. It's a wicked, crazy world. You're alive. You can breathe. Most of y'all walked in here. That's grace right there. You want some more? Questions? Anybody? Before we close. Okay, let's go back real quick to that. I just want to read that last part of chapter 7 again because it was so good, starting in verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And actually, go down to verse 22. I'm winging it at this point, guys. By so much more, Jesus had become surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for making intercession for us. Thank you that you're able to save to the uttermost. Thank you, God, that your word is perfect and powerful in every way. Lord Jesus, please, for the hearts that were touched here, whether it was the lesson learned from tithing or whether it was the, the way that you're able to save to the uttermost, may the message that you wanted us to receive stick in our hearts and minds. May those that don't know you come to know you. Those that need freedom from financial burden and woe, may they be free today. And anything else that you want to do in our lives that you're doing in a supernatural way, those that we prayed for for healings and for family members and support, God, I thank you that your word says that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our supplier. Bless us, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We love you and we thank you. In Christ Jesus, amen. Amen.